Hey friends, I never thought in a million years I'd get to interview Patrick McCabe. And when Paul Suntup told me, Hey buddy, December's book is Butcher Boy. Here's Patrick McCabe's email. I about died and then I came back to life through just sheer willpower because I knew I could not die if I was getting the opportunity to talk to Patrick McCabe. And so I did. I was at the knee of a genius whose book I've loved for, what, three decades now? Amazing. Per Patrick McCabe wrote the perfect book, and I got the chance to tell him so. And it was amazing, and I'm awkward as hell. It's I, I probably can't watch this interview because I'm cringy, to quote my daughter. I, I'm I'm just, I'm unworthy, I'm outclassed, but I'm loving every minute of it. And it's my one big regret that I couldn't return the joy that he had given me. Um, and I even put a theory uh, before him about Butcher Boy, and he kind of dismissed it, but not in a mean way. Um, and this video, this interview does contain spoilers uh, to the Butcher Boy. Some, some... Some are explicit spoilers, but most of it is flavoring, will flavor how you read the book because it's a discussion of, uh, of, of what happens, of course, and it, it'll flavor your thoughts. So if you've never read the book um, or you don't mind having your thoughts steered like we do lead the witness here, we will tamper with that jury before you even get to hear the case, um, <clears throat> then by all means, watch it. And it's, I think, an amazing interview because of Patrick McCabe. A lot of it is me just shutting up and listening. So there's there's that. There's some real value there. Um, I actually share the artwork with him, and and he he his reaction is is charming. Him and his wife uh, see it, and so there's a, there's a lot. I'm I'm not gonna I'm getting ahead of it. Um, this is actually the stumbling buffoonery. Uh, that is on my part of this video, so um, I'm just at a loss in some parts because it's Patrick McCabe, man. He was great. He he was he was really brilliant. So um, anyway, I can keep saying that, or I can let you see it, and I think I'd rather let you see it. So um, have at it. I think it it's really um, really incredible this book and this opportunity and and i'd like to take this one little moment to thank paul suntup and and the team there for actually publishing butcher boy it's crazy that it's never seen a limited edition and um and it, it, i say in the interview that this is justice this is actually justice uh for for such a brilliant work and i i love that Suntup is doing it, and I am deeply appreciative of this opportunity to interview um, one, of, one of the most brilliant living authors today. It was an honor that I wasn't quite ready for, but I, was, I stepped up to it because, wow, who wouldn't? So, hope you enjoy the interview. Certainly hope you enjoy Butcher Boy and, and, and uh, as a Suntup edition. I'll leave you with that. Stay frosty. Uh, for once, I'm not talking to myself. It's time to go beyond the book and get over your shell. Phone is working. I had, to, I had to hit recording right away. Oh, my God. Yeah, my son has the exact same microphone. You sound like you're going to do a DJ. You're gonna hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fillmore West. This is the greatest hits from the Tower Bar or the Cafe. This, this is the greatest hits from Clonus County, Monaghan, home of Francis Brady. Uh, now, just let me point. try something. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Just let me try putting this down and see if you can hear me so that I don't have to hold it like some low rent Mick Jagger. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Uh, it's can a you, little quiet. Me, but can, can you hear me loud and clear? I can hear you clearly. I can okay. hear you clearly. Um, okay. Wow. So thank you for 
going through all this this hell. Uh, okay. We're an hour and eighteen minutes into our interview, and I get to ask you some questions. We've got lots of time. We've got lots of time. Okay. All right. I, I appreciate it because it's a no, lot. Take your time. Don't don't rush anything. Just just put that down to rehearsal. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. Well, so, you know what? You, th you think this is bad. I've just been recording 600 pages of my new novel. And the first day I spent in a recording studio, only you get a call the next day from the engineers that we lost everything. Oh, my so God. You think, you think this is bad, do you? Oh, my God. 600 pages? No, just the first day. So oh that was my. About, about 120 pages. Oh my God. So you're do oh man. Well, I could see with that microphone why they wanted you to read your book with the, the golden velvety tones. Wow. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> tremendous. That's horrible. Um yeah. I well, mean it I'm does happen. And anyway, I, I've had all, all sorts of problems with this Zoom. Yeah. I think lots of people do. It, it cross channel anyway. Yeah, I think this is a um it, it's touchy especially when you go across borders and, and oceans yeah, hold up. yeah so it's it's an iffy thing um at best and we all like to think we become experts at it but no that's right yeah um, so i i would like to have a, a spoiler free discussion but i don't pretend to think i have that level of restraint after all these years uh and um and the butcher boy has been i think two books knocked me flat uh the road by cormac mccarthy and butcher boy and um there are two books that i consist i constantly try to revisit um but you're not always in the mood for such a fine meal and uh so it's 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 been a long time so i have some questions and i think you know what's interesting to me about the butcher boy is when i read it when i was a 20 something kid right uh I thought, wow, that kid's messed up. It's like a, it's like Huck Finn on acid. I don't know why I had that in my head. And well, it's I, a frontier story. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's why, and that's why Americans seem to like it. You know. Really? Uh, that's yeah. Funny. Honestly, I, I, mean, I was teaching in both Pittsburgh and Indiana. And some graduate students, some postgraduate students. What amazed me, and I genuinely say this uh, uh, in all sincerity. I was amazed the level of understanding, first of all, that they had read it. And secondly, the level of understanding and empathy that they had with it. Now, I have to say also that when I was young, I had the same empathy for American literature, particularly the literature of the South. Mm -hmm. And I think it's to do with language, it's to do with travel, and it's to do with freedom and to do with the frontier, you know, the wide open spaces, the, all that kind of stuff. But I think um, uh, Francie's running to those wide open spaces because because the, the town has failed him. Every, everybody has failed Francie Brady. You know, he so, said, so I, I know, but you know what struck me? So I, when I read it in my 20s, I thought, you know, it's trippy. Um, and I loved the way language uh, allowed me to be in the story. And then the second time I read it as a dad and I thought, I'm never going to touch a drink. <laughs> I'm going to be there for my son. This is, this is, oh, nothing's more important. I can't let my son down. And then upon the last week, uh, upon another reread, I was struck with Francie Brady is the only honest person. The whole, everything is a lie. Everything, every alo. His, his parents' honeymoon. Uh, Mrs. Connolly is sweet to people's faces, but she'll gossip once they walk away. Everything. Uh, the fact that he could walk into the, the institutional school and, and tell them, uh, I, I saw the Virgin Mary and all the saints, and they want to believe it. Everybody wants to believe the beautiful lie. And he lives in a town of buildings with 100 windows, but, but a town of softly closing doors as well. And I, I never saw it that way before. And I, I, I really did see him as the first victim. He, do, he does horrible things, but it's, it's incredible. I don't know. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, no, that's all very interesting. 
And uh, what's extraordinary to me after all this time, because I've written many books, as you know, probably, but none of them has lived as long as this one. And I don't suppose I'll ever write one that will you know, continue to excite such a curiosity as much as anything else. I mean, it's been, what is it now, 30 years since I wrote that book. But, right. And when I wrote it, I didn't really think, first of all, all the indications were that it might sell a thousand copies or 2000, like most literary books, you know, and that that would be the end of it. Because if you think of the constituent parts of it and go back 30 years in your mind, what has it got? It's got everything that every god awful Irish novel is expected to have. It's got um, a long suffering mother, an alcoholic father, right. um, a deviant priest, rain, <laughs> gossip. It's got everything that yeah. should make it a failure, really. Uh, but my view, my view was that cliches are only cliches because they're true. And all of those figures that I've just referred to, they actually have their genesis in real life, as it was lived in Ireland, say, in the, pa the previous hundred years to when I before I arrived and continued to um, abide until more recent times, I suppose, when almost uh, overnight yeah. the, the social structure of what I had known was erased almost like a tidal wave which didn't come as a surprise to me, of course, because the only difference between Ireland and the rest of Europe in many ways, or America particularly, was one of um, misfortune in the sense that it was a small country beside a big country. And we all know what big countries do to small countries. Yes. And we're not going to get into all that because no. the, book, <laughs> the book doesn't deal with it. But that right. was the inheritance. So it was only a matter of time, having grown up in a small town, as I knew that the urban world, the urban and sort of technological world as it was beginning in the 60s, which had, you know, transformed, they say, cities like Pittsburgh or transformed all many English towns, that it was only a matter of time before the world that I grew up in vanished. And it was almost like a subconscious commitment to myself that maybe springing from Ulysses, that if James Joyce could make a myth out of a small town like Dublin, then it might also be possible to do the same in language for my own town. But for to that to succeed, I had always felt you must be authentic. You must be true to the experience in your own material. The same way as Mark Twain was authentic, the same way as Flannery O'Connor is authentic, the same way as William Faulkner was authentic. And it's coming under fire for it now for all sorts of reasons. But at the time, mm -hmm. you can only adhere to the principles of your own art. And uh, if, if time changes that in some way, that's for another generation to, de to debate. You know, I mean, yeah. that, that's fair enough. But the thing is, to get back to your original question, like, I thought, okay, it's going to be difficult because not that many people may be interested in small towns, but I'm not really interested in whether they're interested or not. I'm interested, <laughs> I'm interested in getting the language and the authenticity in place. And I spent many years trying to develop a style that didn't repeat Faulkner, that didn't mimic Joyce, that didn't, you know, to do all sorts of things. I didn't want to just report things, put it that way. Right. And, you know, I think cliche is one thing, and it matters if you've been exposed to something repeated times. So uh, I don't know that, I guess in a way, you know, I think um, it, I, I did realize that some of these were tropes. Um, but it's very believable and real. And it's, it's not just the small town, but it's a human, the, the, the human connections and how society sort of failed Francie and how he just keeps going through the cracks and his, his quest for answers and his quest for, why don't you just tell me why you don't want to hang out with me? Or why don't you just like, he's, he's begging for the world to be straight with him. And, uh, and of course, in his twisted mind, it, it gives him license to, to act any number of ways. But in the end, he's also lying to himself. He's, he's trying to believe that Joe wouldn't turn. No, oh, Joe wouldn't do that. And, and my da's alive. He's, he's right there in the chair. And he's, he's walking away from all those hard truths. And um, 
and when he's in the institutional school and he's he's talking to father sullivan <laughs> and uh when father sullivan is doing all his dastardly horrible things what gets francie upset is when he starts going after the truth he's he wants to know what's the worst thing you've ever done or what's your home life like and and once he approaches there that's that's the breaking point for francie and um i don't know i i i just feel like upon these rereads these layers come visible to me and and they weren't in any any of that previous readings but um I, I don't know when your ownership of the book like you you talked about writing it and you wanted to be authentic when do you feel like it becomes property of the reader from well from the day i sent it into a publisher it becomes the property of the reader but i would like to kind of expand a little bit on the way i see this whole business which is i suppose i've written maybe 14 or 15 books now, one or two that haven't been published. But to me, if this doesn't sound ludicrous, they're all one book. Ah. In this sense that all the material that you're mining or exploring, it's a constant kind of journey onwards towards... Now, you've described it as the great lie uh, Francie is trying to expose, but I've always thought Francie is just one other aspect of a greater arc if you know what I mean mm -hmm. that in a sense it's like the whole you know sort of squad of these books they they have a kinship with both the Garden of Eden story and the, the biblical kind of epics of you know being exiled from a place where you for beauty was ever present, omnipresent, and then it's taken away. So you, it's a religious book also in the sense that original sin in the Catholic religion is this sense of something missing the day you're born. What is it? And why do we build these great mosques? Why do we build these great temples? Why, you know, is Ireland studded with churches that reach to the sky? And in a way, Francie Brady has that same kind of thing of yearning towards the sky. What does it mean? You told me you knew it, what it meant, but you don't know either. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the sociological reading of the Butch Boy has always, how, however flattering, has always to me to be, has seemed to be somewhat inadequate. Uh, mm -hmm. It's simply the world in which he moves. That, that the depth of what he's searching for is the age old quest of belonging and truth. Yeah. They are mythic. They are mythic, epic things that I would have explored over a long period of years now. Not that I'm any further to the, the <laughs> closer to the truth, but I can understand perhaps more than ever in a secular age how deep this yearning goes in people. Yeah, uh, may not surface till they have children, for example, and may not ever surface. But there's somewhere you know, almost in every religion in the world, this sense of something missing. And that's what it's there for, to try and make sense of this. So without getting into a theological discussion, you know, the, the real core of the butcher boy is the sundering of his love for his friend. Yeah. Because he thought that was the one place, that was the paradise to which he could go that would never be sundered or betrayed. So when that falls victim to yet again the inadequacies the inadequacies of being on the earth all hell breaks loose and you burn the world down when love is destroyed i suppose you know and i think uh no matter how many no matter where i was in the stage of life when i read this book that last sentence always knocks a tear out of me that last passage the last part uh because it's almost like if this was a, a cheesy slasher book, I guess you'd have to say, "Oh, he's setting up for a sequel." Like, but no, it, it's 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 this. Maybe he's found it finally. Maybe he's found what he was looking for in the whole book, and that's all he ever wanted was somebody to uh, to chip away at the ice puddle again. You know. Um, and it, it sort of just knocks me as he's, as he's running off. But 
But the guy he's watching is walking away. He's not walking towards him. Oh, oh, he's okay. Walking away. He's looking at him, but 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 he's going. It's like the end of a movie where you know it's the wrong end of the telescope. Oh, he's, wow. he's actually going the other way. So my reading comprehension's for shit. <laughs> no, it's, it's no such thing. It's no such thing yeah. because um, you must remember that Francie's possession of, or his perception is so so skewed by the sheer depth of his wound that even in the last sentence he remains unreliable and uncertain of what it is he's seeing himself and so uh okay so th that brings that's a that's a it's a great setup for um one thing i was wondering uh and i saw an interview with you as you, you talked about the neil jordan movie of of the butcher boy and and how you approached it and i thought that was very humble very um respect respectable or <laughs> with, with a lot of respect toward other creative um interpretations and and how you handed it off to neil jordan but he has a respect for the written word and he was very uh faithful oh, to i it. mean for to get someone of the caliber of neil jordan to first of all show interest in your book but then to actually express interest in scripting and directing it i don't know if you have an idea just how high the esteem I have for someone like him. Wow. I mean, he's a marvelous writer for a start um, outside of his, his uh, cinema work. You know, his book, Night in Tunisia, which was published in 1976 when I was only starting to seriously write myself, it was quite a groundbreaker in Irish fiction because it managed to fuse the, the uh, bebop of Charlie Parker and John Coltrane and various people of that uh, with the Irish rural semi-urban experience in a way, again, that was authentic, that didn't jar and didn't seem imposed in a self-conscious fashion. Mm -hmm. So I was very, uh, I, I mean, I was really thrilled when he expressed interest in it because I, as I say, and I say this very genuinely, that when I published that book, I didn't expect really very much interest in it. That's Well, it's, that's amazing to me because I think the book is, is perfect, is a perfect book. And that's a rare thing. It's a gem, an <laughs> emerald gem. Uh, but, you know, one thing, uh, when the movie came out, uh, I was a, a, a huge new fan and I, want, I resisted it, but I did see it. I, I always end up seeing the movies because I thought there's no way you can bring this because we're in Francie's head. We're, we're, we're getting that unreliable narrator and we're, you know, when, when you first read it, you're not aware of what's going on with his dad. <laughs> and then he gets the job at the abattoir, but you, you don't understand necessarily. You do have to piece things together. You have to, uh, you have to get to know Francie and, and, find out what he's leaving out of the picture uh and in a movie it's it's there um and, and so i owe it to myself to see it again uh you know well, it was considered exactly as you say at the time as unfilmable yeah and, you know there was a confluence of events that just made it possible i mean neil had just had a smash hit movie you know and uh you know, interview with the vampire by Anne Rice, mm -hmm. uh, David Geffen produced it, you know, and you know how in the, the film business, it's the one, one area where art and commerce have to shake hands and have to yeah. hug each other very, very deeply because <laughs> people are putting their, their money on the line and they have power over things that they may not have if you're just scribbling away for a small press and hoping to sell a couple of hundred copies. But when you're moving into this commercial league, all sorts of compromises generally yeah. have to be made. But because it was uh, coming off the back, I think, of a, you know, a worldwide smash, really, maybe there was some latitude extended that mightn't otherwise. I don't think in a million years, first of all, I don't think the book would be published now. And I don't I know for sure the movie would never be made. So timing is very important. Yeah, I saw that uh, you were you were a judge at a film festival again. Mm -hmm extremely humble saying, oh, 
never, I never thought I would, uh, I would do this and I didn't think I had the right to, but you get a little older and you have a little more experience and you figure my opinion is, is, is worth. Uh, yeah. Well, I meant that. Yeah. And I, 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 I was blown away by that. I, I think, um, I really don't know what I was thinking your attitude would be about those things. But when somebody writes a perfect book, I just assume <laughs> they're, you know, they're, they, they have a certain, um, sort of yeah, but remember jeff it, it's within your gift to say that it's perfect it's not within mine i don't I know that. Yeah. i don't know what it is or it isn't because oh. as i say it's it's part of a larger story in my head you know as you write you know prose and continue to write it into your dotage i suppose at this point i start drooling and spouting gibberish of all sorts <laughs> but it hasn't happened yet but maybe that's what you just keep doing if you're a fiction writer i don't know mm-hmm. maybe it's a different thing now with technology uh prose may be uh overshadowed by the visual i don't know i mean there are, i'm sure there are many experimentations going on in various aspects of technology and the various political subgroupings that are now emerging uh which are not my vernacular as it were but it's still nonetheless a Rubicon that's being crossed of some kind as we move into the middle of the next century, it'll be quite an extraordinary place artistically. I don't know what it will be like, but it'll have moved a fair distance from the five old gentlemen nodding by the fire discussing <laughs> Victorian sagas, you know. Right. It's, yeah, I mean, you think, uh, and, but, but something you said when, in, the, in the video, you were talking about exa- exactly what you just said about how Butcher Boy wouldn't be published it, it sure, sure as hell wouldn't be filmed. Uh, and do you, and you said something similar that there needs to be a guarantee for these studios to make a movie that it's going to return worldwide. Now they don't just think of U S and UK. They, they no. think, they think China market China and, and India. Yeah. So, and at the same time we have, self-publishing and we have all kinds of people who sure. have grown up like weeds through the cracks to, to to better or worse i mean there's a lot of garbage out there but there's a lot of great stuff sure. so it there there's a there's a there's a tension there um do you ever see it swinging back to sort of more risk-taking in the corporate media or like or because they got to tap into those things well i mean it wasn't the corporate studios that made easy rider yeah you know nobody saw easy rider coming yeah this was a, a movie which changed the whole american and worldwide landscape suddenly you had a massive influx of american filmmakers setting up offices in london you know in paris new york everywhere because they didn't know what was coming in the post-Vietnam era. So they didn't want to be left behind. But then, as now, as in the future, it'll be somebody, some young man or woman, distressed about something, that wants to pray but can't. Something stuck in their throat. They'll write something that they think will only mean something to them about this herringbone that's stuck in their throat. And then someone will say, my goodness, how did someone know what I was thinking? And that could happen anywhere in the world, as always. And uh, the definition of the Ezra Pound evinced of art, which was news that always stays news, mm. will, I think, into the next millennia remain the case. But it'll never be what you expect. And it may come, you know, for example, my children are in their thirties now and they would have grown up maybe or come of age at the onset of the dial up kind of techno, but that, that for them now, which to me was the cutting edge of technology (laughs) is for them. Nostalgia. Right. Hear musicians, you know, incorporating in their experimentations or not even experimentations any longer, but in their music, say, you know, the, the earlier video games, which to them seem outlandishly primitive. But to me at the time seemed really something like the space right. age, or whatever. So everything, you know, follows, the, although this, the, the pace of change has accelerated. That's, that's something that really 
my mind wouldn't be equipped to deal with because were you, I didn't grow up in the video age or the, the uh, streaming age. So children now, the speed at which their mind moves and the, the way they can parse and analyze visual images, like I have grandchildren and I see again another jump, but they are fascinating to watch these jumps. Um, they bring good and bad with them, but then that's always been the case. You know, and it's amazing because uh, I got two things I, I want to say, but I used to have a job in marketing and part of our data, part of what we measured against was how quickly we had to make a message accessible, uh, impactful, whatever. I hate that word, but uh, I know. we had to make them. <laughs> we no, had no, make, sure. we, you had half a second, you, the, but they're not, it's not because they're not paying attention. It's because they're absorbing. That's right. At incredible speeds. Yeah, much, um, much, much quicker than any previous generation, I think. But I will say, if you took Francie Brady and you dropped him in 2020, uh, there might be interesting, uh, interesting impacts, the pandemic as well. But if you dropped him, that's what makes the story work and news that's always news. You drop him in any time. And you could change the details. You can change some of the things and in, in the in the technology, and the, but the story could still be pure and, and the same. And I think um, it it would be interesting uh, to see that. And my understanding is, and I don't know how you did this, but you snuck a sequel past me um, every now and then. I I will Google. I don't know if you know this stateside, it's impossible to find your books. I, oh, I know that. Yeah. I, I, I go, I go out of my mind. I go through used bookstores. I order them online. Uh, I got, I got this one heartland. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a, I need hardcovers. I'm just stupid that way, but, um, I had to get this. And of course, being a fan, I had to get it uh, signed. So I got it signed copy, but it's impossible to find. And um, how did I get Heartland, but I missed the big Yaru? Well, I'm not a, in a position to say, you know, who distributes books or how, how, uh, how a book gets from me into one's, one's reader's hands. Um, my own view, right from the beginning when I embarked upon this enterprise, was that there would be huge ups and downs, that there would be peaks and valleys, because I'd read nearly every biography of any consequence about um, the lives of writers. Now, it does seem to have changed to some extent in that there's a more of a tendency towards it being a career uh, yeah. than, than there might have been in my time. But the catalogue of, of writers that I read, it was such a, an inventory of disaster and catastrophe, and from Dylan Thomas to Brandon Bean to Joyce to you know, Racine to Verlaine or Rambo, whoever, don't expect this to be an easy ride was the thing that I had right. anticipated and that emotionally it would be very taxing. So you move then from total anonymity to being omnipresent. There was a while when you couldn't pick up a paper, but somebody was talking about the big year or about the butcher boy and that went on for a while. And then tastes begin to change. Now in this country, particularly, it was as if like, as it hurtled towards uh, urbaneness or, uh, we say, metropolitan views, which were being imported, really, rather than growing organically, but imported at a furious rate of knots from Europe and America, vis-a-vis -vis cuisine and, you know, various other developments, that something of the order of which I was writing began to seem, I think now, in my estimation, as old-fashioned, you know? And... Uh, that didn't surprise me entirely. I mean, but it wouldn't just sway me one way or another. But uh, then the books began to get badly reviewed. Mm. Um, you know, consequently, things like money would drop and then it becomes more difficult. And then I think around the time of uh, the bank, the crash, there was a kind of a the worldwide financial crash that started in America, publishing went through some kind of a change. I think yeah. it became very difficult for young writers to, to uh, get their work published and self-publishing became a thing. Obviously, people will find other ways, but so did established writers. So I began to notice that there was certainly a, a cooling off or cooling of, of ardor. But 
by the time this had happened, I was so well insulated against that, that yeah. it was really of little consequence to me. Now, obviously, I'd much prefer if people in America or Europe were reading books like Heartland and The Big Yuri, which I particularly am really fond of, maybe because nobody reads them. You know, it could be like, you know, you have a beautiful child and maybe its sibling is maybe not quite as, but that's why you love them all the more and mm -hmm. uh, protect them all the more. So I would have no doubt whatsoever, you know, if the other book was good in time, these, these will be seen in the way that they were intended, that they are part of a large narrative that I started maybe 1975, around that time, seriously. And probably I have a book, a book coming out in April called Pogue Mahone, which is going to be available in America. And, oh, excellent. Uh, and uh, that, that will probably do reasonably well, I think. But as I said, that's all the same to me anyway, uh, at this stage. If it does well, good. I mean, if it doesn't, it's still the same book to me. What's your favorite Patrick McKay book? Do you know what I'm going to tell you? The book that was absolutely annihilated in the press when it came out is my favorite book. And it's called Emerald Germs of Ireland. Do you want me to tell you why? Because <laughs> it was completely misunderstood. It was, it was reviewed in, uh, mostly in the American press as a sort of a Francie Brady serial killer. The book is, in fact, a parody of the kind of ballad sheets that uh, Bob Dylan would have been very conversant with. And uh, when I was growing up, there were many of these available, like Emerald Gems of Ireland. These are sweet little songs, you know, of, uh, you know, sweet little gentle rural numbers, which I was parodying. The book was a joke and it was reviewed seriously. So therefore, I'm going to stand by it and uh, protect it as best I can. Well, I, I when when I talk to people about, you know, when 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 we've talked to, in these Suntup circles and I'll talk about Suntup in a second. But sure. uh, we, when, whenever they ask, what do you want Suntup to publish? I'd always say Butcher Boy, Butcher Boy. I need to see this book uh, as a Suntup edition. And um, and other people would say, oh, I, I, I'm going to read it. What else would you recommend? The second book I always recommended was Emerald Germs of Ireland. And I didn't, I, I always took it as a dark comedy. I didn't realize the connection, the... the. Well, I was warned about that. I, I showed it to a friend when I had finished. She said, are you entirely sure that people <laughs> are going to understand? Because they've got to know the original before yeah. they can understand the parody. They've got to know these ballad sheets. And of course, most people didn't because too yeah. much time had passed and nobody got the joke except me, which was rather <laughs> unfortunate. Well, I, I mean... I, I just I, I loved it. I felt like every chapter he'd begin a new and everything was great. And then he'd meet a new friend and then the friend would have to go and do or say something, just something. Why did you have to do that? <laughs> it, to me, it, it was of uh, it, it did feel very musical. It felt like chorus verse and, and that. And uh, that's all it was meant to be a song sheet, song yeah. sheet book, you know, and the broadside ballads, that kind of thing. But it wasn't seen that way because, you see, unfortunately, I'd come from nowhere to be anointed as a, a profoundly serious writer. And in fact, I'm anything but serious in my own life. And I just wanted a lighthearted skip through the, the abattoir. And, uh, you know, when I saw the reviews, I was genuinely horrified because oh. it hadn't it hadn't been intended that way at all. That's got, how do you deal with that? How do you? Ah, Well, I mean, I was kind of depressed because you know it was a different book that was being reviewed so if, if you're picking up every newspaper and they're reviewing something and demolishing it for for reasons that you don't understand well obviously you're going to be frustrated but that lasts about maybe a week and then you, just, <laughs> you get it you forget about it then yeah i think it's it's good advice to not let the the negative criticism get to you but it's also good advice to not let the praise get to you you know well you've got to be neutral of course right. you know because if you're not immune to flattery you're finished i mean yeah you know but uh that 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 whole world has also changed i mean i'm speaking in the, of the days when you know people assiduously read the observer or the guardian or the new york times or the Elliot times or the book review say well, I can't imagine outside of academia that yeah. that has the same cachet because 
any longer because you know now you have obviously you know a world wide web where everyone who's interested in the arts can voice their opinion that has many good things too because there was a time when you think jesus there were some of these people making pronouncements from mount olympus you know and all the poor newts at the bottom of the mountain had to go yes sir no sir whatever you say sir you're you're the big academic you know everything right you're getting a lot of people coming along well hold up here a second oh whoa 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 you it's know funny. I, I just had the same conversation with my children uh yeah. we're, we're talking about television i go there was a time there were three networks yeah and they played what you were going to watch and mm -hmm. you might have liked it you might not have but that's what that's they what you got you. yeah uh and 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 the the flattened hierarchy the democratization of 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 media uh it's interesting it's it's had some some interesting effects they said twitter killed the uh twitter killed the dud movie so a movie used to have at least one good weekend it could come out on a friday and then it wasn't until sunday or monday papers that the the official critics would write right yes it up. that's right that's right but now people go to the movie and they tweet as they walk out and it's, yeah but see that that can't be good either I mean, if it's a tentpole movie, that's fine. You know, it's just Captain America versus, you know, yeah, Doc yeah. Octopus. And so let's not get too excited about that. But if it's a really serious movie yeah. that people have spent many years developing, it's just not fair to go clickety-click when you're leaving the marquee. Oh, for sure. And it's, it's uh, yeah, no, it's, it's we can't have a consensus deciding what is art. No. No, it has other dangers as well and that the, the major corporations you know when they see what people like i've i've you know watched a lot of streaming in the past couple of years and i've begun to notice that between the writer's room and algorithms there's formula developing all over the place that i don't warm to i i see so many things that are alike now that you know it's almost like it's eating itself you know yep and uh, there are developing then separate sites like Mubi that are curated, which is actually more like the older system whereby people sat down and talked about the movie. And th so, you know, if you've got all this fragmentation going on, that's the one side of it that I don't really like in that while it's de democratic and fascinating, it's better to have the old and the young mixing rather than separating out into these kind of... Uh, commodified factions you know whether they're almost at, at odds with each other and that's never been my experience like i mean the world that francie brady grows up in is a world that has 12 year olds 20 year olds 90 year olds all intermingling you don't get to choose who you live beside in these, right. in these. so yeah. um getting to sun top finally uh what what did you think when you were approached to do this uh limited edition well, first of all, although I'm immune to flattery, <laughs> I was flattered. That's not oxymoronic, yeah. which it is. Um, you see, as I said, quite genuinely, I did not expect to be talking about this character 30 years on, or that a whole new generation, perhaps not two generations, seem to, be, to uh, uh, nurture both a fascination sometimes in abhorrence, but generally, generally in affection for this character. So I thought it's a real nice idea to be offered an opportunity to dress Francie Brady up in a beautiful sparkly suit and send him out with a pair of shades once again into the world. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Uh, and I, I think from my perspective, I was shocked that someone hadn't already done that, dusted him off, picked him up, put him out there. Uh, all these years um so it, it it is a shock to me uh and i'm glad you're flattered i think um it's it had to be done it had to be done i think in some ways it's flattering but this is justice <laughs> this uh this book needed to be uh put in so, such so much of the literary life is good fortune coincidence luck yes. you know i've known writers better than me that believe it or not and people are astonished by these things even yet who cannot get published and not only who are not getting published or are being treated in the most callous kind of fashion this almost seems to 
have become accepted now that a sort of a veiled contempt for the attempts of certain writers is, is uh, acceptable to be voiced in, in a way that I don't remember before, actually. And the reason for that will be, oh, you have no idea how difficult it is out there and the commercial world. And I know all that, but, you know, I used to think that publishers and writers, fiction writers, were in it together. Yeah. Somehow. I don't think that now. No. Now, uh, I think they are with, with the small presses, I think. Oh, lot. certainly. No, I'm talking about the, the general mainstream. Right. Public, uh, mainstream. No, no. Small presses wh- wh- there's coming up now. There is no question, but they're fulfilling the role. But if, uh, they're kind of going to be treated badly, too, because they take the risks and are then gobbled up. And the, the writers leave the small presses mm-hmm. because they have to make a living. Mm-hmm. But that's getting quite cruel now, I think, you know, when the, the major corporations... Uh, eat up the smaller but you see I've taken the uh, step of publishing with Unbound which is a a crowdfunding enterprise based in London which really seemed to me to be the uh, model almost for the future and the the book that I'm publishing with them is called Pogue Mahone which in Ireland means kiss my backside yeah right (laughs) but it, 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 um, it was the most glorious experience because both the editors John Mitchinson and Rachel Kerr are very experienced hands in business and in art there were there were books uh, book editors with uh, Harville and uh, I think a couple of other major publishers and John Mitchinson was the marketing manager at one point of Waterstones so he really knew how to mm-hmm. sell books but more importantly than that was he understood what I was sending him and didn't sort of sort of sigh wearily, which seems to be the kind of standard response now when a 600 man, man, page manuscript lands with a thump on someone's <laughs> desk. They don't say, oh, my God, we might have another Beckett or we might have another, um, you know, that we say, um, who, who could it be? Uh, Alan Rob Greeley, perhaps, <laughs> or someone like that. They go, oh, God, I have to read this over the weekend. <laughs> you know, that's the usual now, but uh, they weren't like that at all. And they, they got back to me in two days and I said, well, I have no experience of this. He said, we're going to make it happen. And he did. Wow. So so uh, you probably might not want to answer this. So was is that your parting ways with New Island? No, it wasn't. Oh. It wasn't anything. To, there was no bad feeling of any okay. description whatsoever. It was just that it was probably probably a commercial decision really on their part mm. yeah i noticed uh i was looking for hardcovers of the big yaru and i didn't i didn't find any so was it published as a, in a hardcover and it was yeah i think it was a couple uh, of hundred of them done very beautifully done and very but i think the problem if publishing an artist distribution is very very difficult for a small publisher yeah and i understand you know i was very glad to get a publisher at all at that point because I say, I say it's very difficult for someone looking from the outside in to the, the world of public. They think, oh, this guy has won a bunch of prizes, you know, and, you know, he's an original voice. But that changes. And, you know, editors come and go. And I'm, I guarantee you that there are very few writers that haven't gone through what you might call a fallow period. but are not very keen about admitting it because it seems like an admission of failure. But seeing as that wasn't my goal in the first place, my goal, as I said to you earlier, from the age of 15, was to get, was to build a mansion of words, really, to kind of like grow up in a world which was a small town, overlooked perhaps by the remnants of an ascendancy. And I always wondered, how do they have big houses? How could I build a big house out of my little house? And I thought the only means uh, at my disposal were that of words and language and uh, maybe perhaps a certain agility of the imagination. That was the only way I could see to do it. And it was very much kind of a, an Irish response to an Irish situation in my head anyway. Well, yeah, I, I don't think even just having the will to do it, you, you also had the talent and um, insight into the human, what it means to be human, the human uh, conundrum, paradox, dilemma, you know, whatever. Uh, it's but you know I learned that from for particularly for for the butcher boy w- one of the major influences on the butcher boy was Davis Grubb's Night of the Hunter, and people say 
in what respect? Because when they look through the Night of the Hunter, which was made into the famous movie by Charles Lawton, uh, it was way before your time, in the 40s, I think. He only made one movie. Hmm. Well, I say, when I'm asked this question, what do you mean that it was influenced by it? I said, well, Night of the Hunter is written in a stream of consciousness narrative style. It flows like the Great River, whatever that Great River is that goes through Idaho or wherever it is. <laughs> and um, it's not the Mississippi anyway, but it might as well be because in all the, 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 the books I used to read about the South, there was always a river of language. And uh, that's what I meant by the infant, although it's also a fairy tale in which the figure of evil is played by Robert Mitchum. You know, I mean, Robert Mitchum just never made a bad movie as far as I can see. And everything I've seen him in, I liked anyway. But he plays a broad-hatted preacher in a sort of a frock coat and necktie. And he has the kind of clerical look that I was very familiar with, you know, growing up and so on. But I always wanted to burst the banks, to use the river and met water metaphor again, beyond the kind of traditional narrative in Ireland that I wanted somehow, because the influence is basically swung like a crazy pendulum between the rural states of America and the, the, the Ireland that I grew up in. It has some of the UK influence, but not so much as in my other books, but America and the small town of Ireland, imaginatively, whether it was Twain or Davis Grubb or uh, uh, Eudora Welty or whoever it might be, it, that's where I was happiest whenever that book was singing. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> um, it's, <laughs> I, you know, I, I was still, I've only left America once and that was to go to Ireland and we went to Ireland on our honeymoon and I thought it instantly felt familiar. And there you are. It, it felt, well, I felt the same about America, you see. Yeah. It, it didn't feel, uh, I felt like I was in another state. Um, people mm -hmm. talked a little differently but it, and, and there were a lot more hills i i come from illinois it's the flattest place on earth and uh uh so i was blown away by the way everybody drives in ireland on the wrong side of the road between a stone wall and certain death on the other side and everybody's doing 80 miles an hour or kilometers uh but other than that it's i i saw so many connections and so much well, Americans like to talk and the Irish like to talk. You know, you meet someone, yeah. you talk to them, and that's the way it is. You don't, you don't waste time, you know, circling each other, you know, and uh, that's, that's common to both places, in my experience. We went, uh, it was three weeks after 9-11, and every, every pub we went to, everywhere we traveled, uh, there were American flags at half-mast, and when we walked in and they heard us talk, uh, everybody offered their condolences like we were at like oh I'm, like we had a death in the family you know well, uh, you did. it was so it, it was so moving and um it, yeah and we we went from dublin to kinsale to cork to shannon to no we bypassed shannon went to galway the Aran islands um as we drove around and it, it felt like home um and, and so I could see that and, and I could see those connections for sure. Uh, I haven't really, I haven't been, I haven't been steeped in Irish literature. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't often see those connections as much, but I think that's why your book worked too is butcher boys is it feels like I can meet these people here. Well, you know, that's why in the little introduction I wrote, where ah. I mentioned, and I constantly allude in the Sun Top edition to Bob Dylan. Mm. You know, Bob Dylan stands alone, I think, in, in a sense that he do doesn't belong to any age, although he is an American myth more than any, anywhere else. But in his book Chronicles, he resurrects and uh, accords its rightful place to one of the greatest vernacular forms, which was so prevalent when I was a boy, was the ballad form, which, like great fairy tales or like birds, moves across 
the frontiers of language that you could that the, the place names could be changed to Milwaukee or they could be changed. To, but the story is the same, whether it's in uh, in London town or Dublin town or Chicago town. The story is about hardship. It's about heartbreak and it's about redemption, resolution or disaster. But Dylan called these songs as as my father and my mother and the people before them call them. Come all you, come mm. all you, you know, come around the fire. I've got a story to share. And it's not a story that I want to share alone, alone with my village, you know, confreres, but with the whole world. And that was the important thing to me was, is there any way you could make your village or your town, the town that someone in India might have lived in, or the town more likely perhaps in... Um, mm -hmm shall we say, I don't know, state of Illinois or Idaho or mm -hmm. anywhere, anywhere in America, particularly maybe in the Midwest or the South. But uh, that, that was really always a constant throb, you know, that that's where I was working from, those kind of mythic versions, mythic versions of them, whether it's the small Irish town or the American one, or even the world. I mean, this book that I have coming out now about is about London in the 70s and now. And someone said to me, well, does it seem strange to you to be writing for the first time outside of a small town? And I said, no, mm. it doesn't, because London is a small town, except that there's 10 million people living in it. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, it's it's yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a, so what is the new book about? It's a psychedelic folktale. Wow. Yeah. It's a, if I could say, it's like, it's almost like uh, the psycho acid bands of the West Coast found themselves in a dream landing in a small Irish village in the 19th century and somehow transported to London where they fall under a dreaded spell, which turns out to be one which was concocted by a certain Dr. Alzheimer. So wow. it's about the disintegration of a soul, basically. Wow. Uh, well, I, I have a few I need to read, a few I need to reread. Um, I wanted to revisit Winterwood. Uh, yeah, that one should be available in America. Yeah, I'm holding it. Uh, yeah, I bought yeah. it when it was brand new. Um, when when i could do such things i don't know why it's it's gotten harder but um and i i read it but i read it a long time ago and i i don't know i was distracted i was a dad i wasn't getting enough sleep so uh, See, that's I, another important thing you know it depends how you're feeling yourself when you read a book right so where, you're, where you're at you know that's a ghastly book you know it's a it's, it's a real gothic horror story and it's not something you want to read whenever you're feeling uncertain about things. Mm. You know, it's not the place. Francie Brady, curiously enough, is the guy he'll bring you along with him. And somehow, you know, you can run with him. It's like, take him to Missouri, man. We're all in it together. Right. So that's a different that's a different trip altogether. Right. Yeah, no, I, I I have to revisit it. But I also. No, you don't have to. Revisit I do. Anything. I do. <laughs> you know, what's the point? Like you buy these books, you have them in hardcover and you have this beautiful edition and you have to read it but i have to read heartland too um well heartland is a rockabilly kick you know that yeah. it's not meant to be shakespeare it's uh <laughs> it's, it's 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 like um it, it's very american it's really american it's tarantino mixed with gene vincent really right right i i and i think that's part of of uh when when i um was looking into it and that's tarantino came up in the in the review somewhere some Maybe oh, yeah. Mark, I think Mark that Mark probably Mark. worked against it. They probably thought that. Yeah. Uh -huh. anyway, I think it's time will come. So um, have you seen the artwork for the Sun Top Edition? I'm waiting. I'm waiting with bated breath. You I didn't see it, it yet. yet. Not yet. Have you got oh. anything to me? I've seen it. Uh, you want me to give you a preview? Yeah. Margo, so come over here to see this. I'm going to introduce you to the artwork. I'm, I'm now going to take this opportunity, Jeff, to introduce you to my beautiful wife, Margo, who is an artist. Hello. Hi. Oh, hello, Margo. <laughs> Margo Quinn. Uh, yeah. So uh, this this 
is some of the art. It's probably not going to translate too well. No, it's translating good. I see yeah, it really well. Looks great. It it's looks really good. Yeah. This is yeah. that watercolor. Pardon? Is it watercolor? I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's an interior uh, illustration. This is this is the cover of the dust jacket for the artist edition, and oh, this this is something else. It's brilliant. Well, oh, that's really good, isn't it? Mm. It is. It is. Uh, and uh, th these are the end papers. Mm. It's Francis Bacon style, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Pardon the pun. Yeah. Pardon the pun. Um, mm. And uh, this is another interior illustration. Um, oh, that's a good one, isn't it? Yes. It's, that's very good. Yeah. I think, oh, uh, Francie with the Virgin Mary. Oh, that's the Virgin, yeah. Oh, that's a winner, I think. How much are you selling those at? What about, the, about a grand each, is it? Uh, I, I don't know about the original pieces. No. Um, this is this is when I saw this when my blood ran cold. Uh, I stopped for a moment um, mm. with him and his dad. Dad, yeah. Oh, that's mm. fucking wonderful. Mm. Yeah. You, and the, it, even that I see the tiled fireplace is really authentic. Mm. It's it's 1950s. Sure. And then uh, oh, two more. So. <laughs> This one, everybody's a pig. Family of pigs. Everybody's pig. a pig. Okay. Mm. And then, mm. uh, and then, of course, uh, the the final act. Um, Mrs. Oh, Nuge. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, mm. I think you've got a winner there. Oh, and, and if you see the side of Francie's face, it it's a side. It's off. You know, it's not the center, but you got so much of a. Uh, of of uh just there's there's the the composition of his features there's this this bitter victory there you know uh yeah. where, where he he seems to finally have have uh have bested his foe but to what end to well yeah it's a pyrrhic victory yeah yeah in yeah no that that looks absolutely marvelous i, I haven't wonder, i wonder as you're bringing that out to our mutual advantage because if there was some way we could get a publisher, a, a mainstream publisher, because the hardback rights are now available. I have them. The, 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 the original publisher is long out of print. Mm -hmm. And Mar Marianne was talking. Hmm? Picador or? No, they weren't. They weren't the publisher in America. The publisher in America, Pic Picador never had the American rights. The, from oh, International. They were oh, called from, from International. Yeah. But they're, go they're gone long ago. So I have the rights now. And you know, there's there's an opportunity waiting there for someone to publish a hardback. Yeah, the paperback rights belong to Dell, but the hardback rights are mine. Wow. So I don't know if there was ever anybody you ran across. I mean, Marianne, I think, is going to be doing something on it. I don't know, but uh, well, I mean, you know, it's 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 interesting. Um, when Suntub came on the scene, uh, a lot of people, a lot of publishers didn't know there'd be too much demand for these high-end books. Sure. COVID did a fun thing, though. COVID made sure nobody could go out. And so people were in their homes. They are not going to restaurants anymore. The, 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 the fun entertainment cash started piling up. A lot of people turned to collecting. And okay. as remarkable as that is, uh, the collectible editions have have sustained and skyrocketed in fact and i think i've seen a lot of small publishers come up because they feel emboldened by what suntup has done sure uh, taking the risks so uh it, it's very possible this edition will kick up a lot more interest in the butcher boy and maybe somebody will feel like okay i have a built-in audience they can't afford these finer editions uh you know but yeah, well, I, I think, you know, any help I can give you getting it out there, it's, it's can only it can only benefit us both, because if there still is interest. And I mean, I wasn't I've only been in, what do you see in America about four years ago and all the students had read it, you know, and I was kind of astounded because I had assumed that American interest in it had died. And then this came up. So it would be a kind of a, a missed opportunity in everybody's part not to reach out to the audience that may well be waiting for it you know, and just can't get it. 
You know, I think uh, a lot of people would read this book and uh, the teetotalers will say, see, this is the danger of alcohol. Oh, there's <laughs> plenty of them. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> the, the social justice uh, mm. folks will say we need more help for uh, for uh, uh, mental health issues. Yeah. I think a lot of people could see this as, as their case study for for yeah. so many things. Well, it has been approached that way. It's not the way I'd intended it, but that's fair enough. It's the reader's yeah. book after it leaves me. But right, uh, definitely right. there has been a lot, a lot of that kind of psychological study and social justice and various other things. So have it operates gotten, in different levels. Have you gotten a uh, reaction from Catholics or Christians with uh, the portrayal of the industrial school and things like that? Well, to be perfectly honest, I think the story of Ireland, you know, everyone has their version of it. You know, and journalists have created a certain view of what you might call of old Ireland, shall we say. And it's usually one of outrage and breast beating and vaguely disparaging sometimes of Catholics and other times not quite so disparaging at all, but almost gleeful. Francie Brady doesn't live in that world. Mm. Francie Brady lives in it, but outside of it. And if you examine the industrial school as aspect, which is very much in the news now, yeah, he has got better things to do than damn another soul like the pervert priest. He's talking about love and where did it go with his friend Joe. He's got bigger fish to fry than journalistic tropes, if you know what I mean. Right. It's a mythic story. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it. it's... Uh... When I first read it, Francie's Bra Francie Brady's reaction to uh, Father Tidley was shocking. Like the, the way he reacted and the way he seemed to, to weather it up until he was pressured into revealing more personal, closer to the nerve center information. Th then that was the line. That was. But yeah. anything you did to to him externally, however, you, however you you interacted with him that way it was all external it, it's almost like francie brady just don't violate my head you know don't don't come after my memories don't come after well, his memories are heaven and you know if you violate them you destroy him so all the little things and the smaller events to him which are the episode with the priest all, these are things as it were that happen down in that minuscule place called earth where yes. i live in is heaven yes and then so when heaven is the gates of heaven are torn down well, where are you then? So that's what the story is about. Like, I mean, as far as the Catholic thing goes, I had absolutely no complaints about that at all. Huh. Uh, even, even Sinead O'Connor as the Blessed Virgin Mary excited as much curiosity and amusement as it did. Right. You know, I mean, people have this view that Ireland was some kind of god-awful kind of prison, but I mean, when you meet the people, you can see that that isn't the case. Right. You know, that, that, right. that they, they couldn't be the way they are if, if they were as repressed by institutions as, uh, as the popular kind of myth seemed to be. In fact, the much maligned priesthood, uh, who have almost vanished now, you don't hear of anyone having what was quaintly called a vocation in my time. Here too. But it, it was generally, if you examine the history, the lay population that brought the complaints to the clergy. So, you know, everyone's in it together, let's face mm -hmm. it. So um, it's very, very easy retrospectively to select one section of the population for virtue signaling com condemnation. And that's a long, long way from the world that Francie Brady lives in. Because he knows oh. I'm damaged, but so are they. Yes, for sure. Um, <clears throat> Now you you talked about heaven, um, and, and you had you had the play uh, Frank Pig says hello, yeah, and then and then you wrote the follow up play The Thousand Leaves of Heaven. Uh, it was called Leaves of Heaven, but it didn't exactly set the world alight. I'm afraid. Oh, okay. So did that become the Big Yaru, or was that? Well, as I say again, it's the same story. You know, one story weaves in and out of another. I don't know where I'm going to go next. Uh, some people say, what's he doing this for? But see, again, I'm not interested in 
you know, any predictable journey that a, a novelist might be expected to have. I only take what is delivered to me and see what I can do with it. And sometimes it's glorious and sometimes it isn't. You know, it's funny because that's that's something I've heard time and again. And I, I heard I think it was a, a quote from Stephen King about writing. And he said, you don't go out chasing characters. What you do is you find a clearing, you build a fire and they come in out of there, out of the, out of the darkness. And they come gather around the fire with you and they tell you their stories. Yes. They might come around a, a fire like Stephen King or Bob Dylan would suggest, but sometimes all you've got to do is close your eyes and you wake up and they've been there in the night. Wow. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I do have another question. Uh, who is Melania? Because I, I bought a signed book of the butcher boy off of eBay and you've signed it to Melania. And uh, I just was wondering who. <laughs> well, I don't know uh, because if, if, it's, uh, if it was a name that I immediately recognized, I'd, I'd put a surname to it. But I think that was probably at a general reading somewhere in the States and uh, it was someone that I wasn't acquainted with. Yeah, I, I won't I, be acquainted with her anymore if she's selling my books on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, it was a big bookseller I bought it from. I know, uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, no, that's funny. Uh, I usually only want flat signed because I'd like to pretend I was there like Francie Brady, but um, it's a nice it, addition, that American one. I like it. Yes. Uh, well, there's a better one coming. But ha has Francie Brady ever shown up at your house at one in the morning saying, uh, why did you have to go and invent Mrs. Nuge? Why did you have to go and write all that about her? Well, he doesn't. Do you know what the honest answer to the question is without being frivolous, Jeff? I don't have to confront him at the front door of my house because he's inside the house. <laughs> to paraphrase Flaubert, when he was asked about Madame Bovary, how did he come up with such a character? He said, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, and I think that's the power. That's why I think, that's why I think this book um, needed to to be reintroduced in, in a really fantastic saddle up John Wayne way. Because, it really is that, isn't it? It's a, yeah. uh, it's a call to arms, yeah. Because because yeah. everything you've said about it, and every every interview I've seen, and there, and even in this interview, the way you're reacting is this. It's a hundred percent authentic. It's real art, and there's there's you know less of that, and I think. Um, getting back to the struggles of writers, there's this one author I talked to, I'm not going to name him, but um, he, he had this, these literary books he, he's been itching to publish, and he, he got no traction, and he couldn't get them anywhere, and nobody had any interest, so he said, screw it, and he started writing genre fiction, horror, and boom, all of a sudden, he's getting his, his books out there, and different editions published, and it's, it's, commerce and and he, he's writing and so he's getting his career uh and then now he's finally getting that literary book well isn't that wonderful it is it is but it's 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 sort of hacking the system and it's a shame that if if he really wanted those books uh, the literary book if that's where his heart is he had to go out and and sort of do do some sort of work but around. my view of that is what a terrific human being that he had oh. the resource and the resolve to do that yes and to sneak his pride and joy like this secret little family in through the back door right I take my hat off to that writer oh for sure yes yes i i my 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 whole take on it was i was just i felt bad that he had to do it but yes sure, we all do he found as a I way say, not, i know plenty of people to whom it's happened but they don't have the talent or perhaps the interest in writing, you know, mm -hmm. wife with a knife thrillers, you know, they just right. don't have. Um, so, who's your your favorite author today? Writing today, other than Patrick McKay, I'm very fond of Claire Keegan. She's an Irish writer that I admire. Um, there are many others. There are a lot of very good writing um, happening at the moment. Anna Burns, people like that. But um, to be honest. I read less fiction now than I read mostly biographies. A lot of people that I read are dead authors, I'm afraid. Mm. And it's not, you know, that I've lost interest. It's just that I don't have the time really as much 
uh, continuing writing like Pogue Mahone, that book I was telling you about that's coming out with Unbound in April, that took me the best part of three years because it's, it's a very big book. And, you know, I'd say I wrote 6,000 handwritten pages because um, it's not that I'm a Luddite. I have great interest in technology, but I have to handwrite everything. Wow. Yeah. That seems so what, eccentric, I know. Where are the handwritten pages for Butcher Boy? Oh, I've got loads of them are hanging around here still, all sort of old looking and sort of <laughs> museum, be museum bound. Collectors want them now. Um, <laughs> uh, well, they're illegible. I'm, I can't even read them. I have to get a magnifying glass. I can't read them because when you're handwriting like that and when it's cooking, it comes through the veins, you know, and it's, it's like Egyptian hieroglyphics more than it is print. It's like automatic writing that it's kind uh, of close once you've got everything in place you know your dreams are aligned properly then it <laughs> but that that takes an awful long time for me to get to you know i have to do an awful lot of back brain work before anything like a proper book appears do you type it up right after or well, at different times you know the main thing is getting all the kind of pages down and leaving it there and seeing if anything um, appears in a kind of a finite form as it were or a structural kind of cohesion emerges and then I type it up and maybe do three or four drafts of that maybe even more sometimes up to as far as 10 depending on what it is you know it's a different animal like some of them are more difficult than others but I don't know how many stories I really would have left at the, you know I think that um, like Arthur Miller said one time, you know, he's a kind of a writer of the 50s, Arthur Miller, I think, but he woke up, I think, around 67 when the whole Vietnam um, generation, the, the, the kind of hippie dream was beginning to assert itself. And he said he felt out of his time, you know, that he felt that he, he didn't know what his function was. I don't know if he carried on thinking like that, but it might actually, you might reach a point where you feel, and I do sometimes feel that, that there are people better qualified than mm. I to, no, well that, no, this is just my feeling. It's not right. hurrying favor or anything. It's just um, the world does slip to some extent out of your grasp. But I mean, on another level, in spite of all the technological and you know, corporate kind of leaps that the world has made, it's still, a place that would have been recognizable to Jesus or Plato. You know what I mean? You still mm -hmm. have babies, you still have trees, you still have moms and dads, you still have nativity plays. But it's, it's a kind of a, a dialogue that I'm having with myself, you know. And with Pogue Mahone, I almost felt that I had got it so right this time. Wow. Um, that the, I don't think, I've just recorded it for audio. And there's nothing in it that I would change, which is to me is the, the, the acid test. And there's nobody more rigorous than I when it comes to, you know, applying the surgeon's knife to something I've written. But I kind of felt there was nothing I had to add to it. There was nothing I had to take away from it. So I just said, away you go. Wow. And that was a very pleasant experience, I have to say. And I've got a great editor with Rachel Kerr. Um, and that's, we a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it's as closest you get in this world to kind of a blissful calm. You know, it doesn't stay for very long because, I mean, after all, it, it is a, an object. It's a book. It's not a child, you know. But right. It's only, it's only the, you know, a limited amount of earthly happiness that such a creation can give you, unlike, you know, say, family or whatever, you know. Sure. Your mother I, mean, or your father. I, think, but, I think there are returns, though. I can't imagine how it feels when you pour so much of yourself into a book. And then you give it to the reader and then Ooh. the critic and then the, the whole storm of, you know, the wind of the wagging tongues going around uh, talking about it. And uh, like you said, they totally they went right over their heads about Emerald Germs of Ireland, mine included. I still loved the book. It's my second favorite, but um, <clears throat> I could see how that uh, when's when's Paul Mahone coming out when it's when coming out, I think, in April in the UK and May in the usa okay yeah so the early part of next year next spring and it's a book i'm very very keen on uh because it brings together an awful lot of the themes that you and i have just discussed actually but again 
is very faithful to that tradition that Bob Dylan identified and praised and reclaimed as his own. Uh, the kind of folk song, uh, rural tradition, you know, whether it's Hibbing, Minnesota or Clonus County, Monaghan. They're, they're, they're twins, really, in my head. The same way as Bob Dylan when he met Liam Clancy, the folk singer from Ireland, they both recognized the same thing in each other, you know, and he was a great influence in Bob Dylan, Liam Clancy. He, he's constantly acknowledged that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's so much of, of our, our the, the U.S. South has a lot, you know, country music is oh, absolutely. completely yeah. tied to folk music, completely no, tied no, no to folk tradition. No question about it, yeah. 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 Um, you know, that's what Heartland came out of. But unfortunately, a lot of people didn't make the links that I was hoping with because a lot of these sort of psychobilly country bands are not really that well known or popular in Ireland the way they were when I was growing up. You know, you got Commander Cody and the Lost Planet Airmen and a lot of these bands. And that's the, the, the rhythms of Heartland are the pulse beats of those bands, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get the key it's written in, then you don't get it, you know. So That's my excuse anyway. So is Heartland more a book for the U.S. than it is for Ireland? It was a book for me, and it was probably, <laughs> probably a complete failure, really. Certainly sales-wise, it didn't do anything. But uh, I'm really fond of it. It's very oral. I'm going to record it because sometimes I think what happens with my books, people don't get in the right key, and that's unfortunate. But when I read it on a tape, they have no problem. Now, it may have something to do with, the Irish vernacular, or it may have yeah. something to do with my, my, my uh, perceptions of the world. But whatever it is, the problems are never apparent when it's, re when it's, heard, when it's read to them, mm. rather than well, them doing the reading. Well, I'm going to have to definitely get the audio book, if you're reading it, of, uh, of your new book, Pogue Mahone. Oh, well, I'd be delighted to send you one. I mean, we've only just finished recording it, and the musician is going to put some bells and whistles on it. So oh, I don't know when it'll be out, but you'll be first on the list to get one. Oh, thank you. I would love to. For sure, uh, yeah. And of course, my hardcover as, as I need. Um, but um, yeah. um, uh, in the meantime, we have a wonderful Suntop edition uh, to, to hold me over until such a time. That's, that's, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm floored right now just to get the chance to talk to you. And yeah. It's it's been amazing, and I'm I'm so glad you hung with me through those technical difficulties. Well, I'm glad that we got the chance to have a, a reasonably good conversation, and uh, you send me that link, and we'll talk again in the future. That's awesome. Thank you so much. See you, my friend. All right, bye don't bye. Forget, just don't forget, take them to Missouri. <laughs> All right, I will. I will. Thank yeah. you. Good luck now. <laughs>